Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, machaba, muni muli wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the crowded mattress studios here in the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville. We are so excited and so very honored that you are joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show. Tell your kids, teachers, and their librarian and their principal. And also, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. Our guest today is Catherine Marsh. She is here to celebrate the lost year. Before we invite Catherine into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by the Chuckle Wobbles, an amazing children's book with an inspiring and positive message written by Prue McDonald. It is a Reading With Your Kids certified grade read. Prue McDonald's The Chuckle Wobbles teaches kids how to cultivate moments of happiness that we may access whenever we're feeling stressed or depressed. The book follows the Chuckle Wobbles, a, a cheery species that live on the planet Mirth, which is spinning in dimensional space. They have an upbeat, bubbly personality, and they love to dance. They have the ability to enter a book called The Portals to Other Planets and to travel to unhappy planets in order to lift the spirits of the inhabitants. This is really a, a really, really fun book. If your kids are into fantasy, science fiction, if your kids need to laugh, you want to get yourself a copy of The Chuckle Wobbles. It is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read, and it's written by our friend, Prue McDonald. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is also brought to you by Easter Eggs and Matzo Balls. It's Janie Amos's second blended holiday book, illustrated once again by the amazing Brian Langdo. In this humorous and endearing story, blending both Easter and Passover, a young boy wants the Easter Bunny to bring his stepsister something special in the golden egg. He suggests various Passover items. But even after squishing and squashing, the Easter Bunny can't make any of them fit. In the end, the boy does more than find something special. He saves his new sister's favorite part of Passover. This is a joyful, engaging, perfect read for culturally blended families, and it's absolutely delightful for all readers. The playful rhymes will keep kids giggling, and Janie's family matzo ball soup recipe included at the end is to die for. You want to get your copy today, Easter Eggs and Matzo Balls, by our friend Jamie Emus. Join us right now from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Our guest is here today to celebrate, I think, a really important book. It's called The Lost Year. Please welcome to the show, Catherine Marsh. Hey, Catherine, how are you? Great. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to have you on. Excited. And I don't know if nervous is the word, but we're, we're, we're going to be talking um, about a subject that's real important that a lot of people don't really totally understand, but I think it's important for our kids, for us to talk about with our kids, and that is the topic of what's going on in the Ukraine and what has gone on in Ukraine and that part of the world. So please tell us a little bit about the lost year, please. Absolutely. So... The Lost Year is about a 13-year-old boy named Matthew who is stuck at home in the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And now you're probably saying, wait, I thought we were talking about Ukraine, but listen in. It, it happened so, there too. <laughs> Matthew is stuck at home with his mom in New Jersey, and his father is a reporter, and he's away in Europe and gets stuck there during the pandemic. And his mother moves in um, his great-grandmother. Um, whose name is uh, Nadia, but he calls her Gigi for great grandmother, um, and she is um, she is a hundred years old, 
And like most kids, and I'm sure this will resonate with a lot of parents, Matthew is pretty miserable. He's not going to school. Schools have been shut down. Um, he spends a lot of his time uh, playing Legends of Zelda on his Nintendo Switch. Um, and that is kind of how he deals with his anxiety over his father being abroad, over the fact that he can't see his friends and go to school. Um, and one day his mom uh, takes away his Switch. Matthew decides to try out a live action uh, reenactment of Zelda and accidentally uses a toy arrow and shoots toward his great grandmother. Um, and she is uninjured, but he is in big trouble. So his mom, um, his punishment that she gives him is to help uh, Gigi unpack some old boxes she has, she's been keeping in storage. Um, and in one of those boxes, Matthew finds a, a photograph um, of two girls, and he shows it to his great-grandmother. It's an old photo, and she just freaks out. She cries. She's very upset. She kind of just becomes really sort of, you know, inconsolable. And basically, um, Matthew realizes there's a story there, that something happened to his great-grandmother, and he decides that he's going to try to figure out what it was. And that is the beginning of a story that takes us to um, both the Soviet Union in the 1930s, specifically Soviet Ukraine, and also um, to Brooklyn, um, where uh, there is uh, also um, a, basically it's the story of three cousins. Um, and Gigi is one of them. And there's also one who is an Ukrainian immigrant in Brooklyn and one who is in uh who is in Kyiv and is the daughter of a Communist Party official and one who is in the countryside um, and is impacted by this famine. So we get sort of the story from three different perspectives. And Matthew has to figure out what happened um, to these girls and why Gigi is still so upset about it. You know, on one level, it sounds like this really fun little thriller, all these different threads that you can kind of pull on and unravel the story and and and, it, it, and and those are fun, but then you add on the fact that this is while this isn't necessarily a true story, it's based on what's going on and what has been going on because history isn't isn't and current events aren't as clear and easy to understand as sometimes we and sometimes the media likes to present. No, there's that that's absolutely true. And I think, you know, I chose to write about two difficult subjects, um, which is the pandemic, um, and also is this very, very painful um chapter of Ukrainian history that few people know about. And, you know, I I decided to sort of tackle both because I felt like definitely with the pandemic that we're still kind of unpacking and trying to process a lot of the anxiety that we experienced during that time. And, you know, we lost a million people, but even if you didn't lose someone, um, you had your life severely disrupted. And I think that's had a big impact on a whole generation of kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, life is more normal now, but I think there's still a lot of, um, you know, processing going on. And I wanted to sort of talk about that and also connect it to another difficult period of history, um, even though it's a really different one. Um, so that was, that was sort of, you know, why I chose to write about both these topics. And with Ukraine, when I started this book and actually finished the first draft of it, um, I was worried that most people wouldn't know where Ukraine was, um, that a lot of kids had no, would no, uh, have no idea. And then as I was, you know, doing the copy edit, um, you know, Ukraine became a big part of the news. And suddenly kids knew about Ukraine and they knew that there was a war and that Russia attacked Ukraine, but they didn't know much else. Mm -hmm. So I felt there was really a chance to give some historical context um, and help kids understand that and also sort of show them a different time that was, you know, these are not the same. They're not, you know, the same type of things, but where kids really suffered and struggled um, and yet talk about how you get through these difficult times. Yeah. And the book is very much about that. It's about, you know, how we use stories to find, you know, resilience. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that, that whole idea of finding resilience, I think is, it's so very important. And I think it's something that, I don't know if it was lost, but it wasn't 
emphasize as much, especially before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. You know, before mm-hmm. the pandemic, we, you know, kids were getting participation trophies and no one was getting bumps or bruises. And we we're all just going to go out there and, and, and have a good time. And a lot of parents were bubble wrapping their kids because they didn't want them to experience any loss. And um, it's it's not realistic. And, and I don't think that's helpful. I, I agree. And I think, you know, I'm also a parent and I understand the impulse. Mm-hmm. I truly do. Um, that we want to protect our kids. But I also think that, you know, that we have to address some of what's happened, both in the pandemic, um, that we have to, you know, talk about, uh, you know, how hard this has all been for us, because Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that has been kind of um, rushed past it. (laughs) And, uh, And so, you know, I feel like it's very important to sort of discuss, you know, to, to, to discuss that experience. And so that's one part of the book. And then the other part of the book, which also connects to it through the characters, is this story of Ukraine and understanding kind of, you know, the history and how it, it has traumatized, um, you know, people there. Um, mm-hmm. And also, you know, how it has sort of shaped, um, you know, the current conflict as well because Mm -hmm. you know most people don't know that this occurred they don't know that there is a lot of um you know anger for this history being suppressed for so long Mm -hmm. yeah you know it it reminds me of i had grown up my my grandparents immigrated from ireland at at different points and uh, my my mom's grandparents Im- immigrated and you know they were first generation i had always heard about this thing about the irish famine but i just thought it was like oh bad luck you know a bunch of potatoes went bad and you know but then as i got older and i found out no oh, well there's lots of food there it was just going to people that weren't living in ireland and there was a lot of shenanigans going on and and again i don't think we do ourselves or our kids any any favors by kind of glossing over that that kind of history. We make mistakes and we need to learn from mistakes. I totally agree. And and I think what's you know what I try to do in my book by having this the cousins of this single family have very different perspectives and experiences um, is to write about the victims of this famine, but to also write there's one character who uh I wouldn't call her a perpetrator because she's a child, but who um, definitely has kind of drunk the Kool-Aid mm-hmm. um, of the uh, the moral wrong that's going on around her. Um, and so the book for me was important because I wanted to write about how people who have been victimized, people whose history has been minimized, how they can find their voices. And we have the character who is in uh, Brooklyn, um, who who sort of goes on that journey um, to defend kind of, you know, what's happening. Um, and then I also felt it was important to have a character who was wrong and, you know, grapples with that. And I think it's really important to talk to kids, to not just preach to them and show them, you know, kids who always do the right thing, but to show them kids who maybe have some wrong views and wrong opinions and can then confront that and change. And I think that's something that we, you know, when I imagine kids and parents reading this together, what I hope is that there are a lot of questions about that, not telling kids what the answers are, but questioning and saying, well, you know, do you think we're, do you think this is right? Do you think this is, how would she change that view? Like how do, how do people change? I think that's a really, really interesting question. Yeah. Um, it fascinates me as a writer. Yeah. And so that's partly also what I wanted to write about as well. I, you know, I think you bring up possibly one of the most important things that we can do with our kids is to sit down when we have this character who is, so wrong. Everybody that's reading the book now is like, duh, why? How, how could you think that way? But that's a really important question because there's lots of reasons why people have the perspectives that they have and that they're looking at the same situation in, in, in very different ways. And I think it is, I think that that's one thing that we're not doing today in, in what, we're, we're, I'm talking about adults and kids, is we're not taking the time to sit down and think, well, why would a person have this perspective? 
beyond just oh they're evil and they're 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 scum and they should be eliminated. It's just like no, this is a human being, and I have to assume that this human being is, is a loving person deep down and and cares about their family. But this person looks at the world in such a completely different way than I do. Let's dig down and find out why that is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I do think in some ways we're doing it better than we used to. For example, I think the way we teach history now, which, you know, my books always have a lot of history in them. And my background is in journalism. And we can talk about that in a minute. But with history, I feel like kids are being asked, instead of just being given a source and saying this is a fact, they're being asked to sort of question, to be more analytical and critical and to say, well, who wrote this and why and what was their perspective and where is they where were they from and where, what do they sort of bring to it? And I think that's really great. But I agree with you that we don't do that as much in our interpersonal relations Mm -hmm. and i think that is that is definitely important um and you know uh i mean i think i think talking about these histories and my my book really centers on a true story Mm -hmm. um of the journalist walter duranti who worked for the new york times and he was their moscow correspondent and he won a Pulitzer Prize. He was really a very successful, well-regarded journalist. Um, However, when the famine happened, um, he listened only to the Soviet government about what was happening, and they denied that the famine was happening. And he was also getting some perks. He had a nice life in Moscow. Um, But because of that, um, you know, the New York Times, the paper record at that point, you know, published an article by him that said, you know, that people were hungry, but they weren't starving in Ukraine, which was not true. Mm -hmm. And I loved writing about this because as somebody who has a journalism background, I think talking about disinformation is really important. And I think it's something that's a, it's a, it's a big issue today, but because it's such a big issue and it's often um, talked about in the context of uh, social media and, you know, with kids, because that's where they get a lot of their news. I don't think they always realize that this has happened before and how it impacts our whole understanding of history. And what I love about this story is that it gives parents and kids and teachers a way to think about the reverberations of a piece of disinformation. And so you can see with this piece, and then he attacked various sort of less well-known people who said, I don't think that's right. And he said, no, 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 I'm right. And he tried to denounce them. So, you know, he dug himself deeper into that. But that shaped that, you you know, we talked earlier about why so many Americans didn't know about this happening. Mm-hmm. And, and that article had a really outsized impact on our understanding of that history. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a wonderful way to kind of get into this subject of like, how do you how do you read critically? How do you make sure you're not looking at one source journalism? Like, what's the bias of the, you know, what, how do you sort of ask those critical questions that can enable you to be, you know, a better reader of the news? Yeah. As a journalist, and, and one of the things that we've talked about here in the podcast, especially anytime we've had journalists on, and we've been blessed, we've had amazing journalists come on who've written children's books, and we've been able to talk about how we can help our kids become more media literate and Mm -hmm. especially how we can help them discern what information and what information sources they can trust. If I were to ask you that, how, how can I help my kids become more media literate? How, what, what do I need to do to help them understand who they can trust it, it's not the three channels that, that I was exposed to when I was a kid. It's three bazillion sources of information that are bombarding our kids every single day. Absolutely. And one of the things I think it's important for our generation, and I am like the generation of, you know, of paper and print. Is it? So I, I come from that to understand is that, you know, I was recently in a classroom um, and I asked kids, if they got their news from social media or the local paper, and I named it, what do you think they said? I'm going to guess they're going to say social media. Not only did they say social media, when I mentioned the name of the local paper, they said, what's that? (laughs) (laughs) So that is, so here's the thing is I think there's a lot of focus, particularly by people who want to kind of get into like very divisive politics, um, 
about, and I think this is a good conversation to have for adults, that they're getting their news from, you know, liberal sources, conservative sources, people are always debating that. But that's not what kids, kids are getting their news from, you know, TikTok and, you know, all sorts of other social media, mm -hmm. right? And I think that it's really important to sort of try to slow down the consumption because what happens is that these are like really quick hits that kids are getting and they're what I think adults need to do is to teach them, okay, wait, okay, so you saw that. What was the source, mm -hmm. you know? Like, where did they get that information? How do you think they got that information? And again, it's going back to some of this critical questioning um, and also sort of slowing down the pace of the way that we consume information. And I think that's really important. And it's part of the reason that I love your podcast and I love the fact that, you know, that you talk about reading with kids because I think that that is something that we all have to do more of mm -hmm. um, in order to kind of, you know, change our metabolism for information just a little bit so what we can add that critical factor. Yeah. You know, we, you and I have not spoken about faith at all, and that's and I don't want to do that. But as you were speaking, a thought occurred to me that I actually think is really important. We've talked on the podcast about the fact that that letting your kids know that it's okay to question their faith is a great lesson. And ha sitting down and talking about whatever faith it may be, it's it's really important. And to question, where did this idea come from? Where did this story come from? Where did this law come from? And I think that that if we allow our kids and have conversations with our kids about something as important as our faith, then it's going to be easier for them to sit down and question like, oh, okay, well, all of my friends are at school and they're telling me this thing about Ukraine or, or COVID or whatever, but is it okay for me to question where it's coming from? And I, I, I just think that the whole idea of letting our kids know that they can ask questions and that that's really a good thing and to get out there and, and, and to challenge authority, whether it's a, 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 a faith leader or a politician or a teacher, I think it, it, and do it respectfully so you don't get thrown out of school. But I think that that's, I think that's a, that's a great service that we can give to our kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But no, I mean, I have, I have a multi-faith background. Um, and I also have a, um, a, an identity that is very, um, different and comes from different parts of, of the region of, you know, Russia, Ukraine, Poland, um, Jewish, Christian, all of that. And I think that that sort of has made me very interested in approaching things with a, with a certain type of humanism. Um, and, you know, I do think questioning is very important. And, and, and that's something that is also um, a important piece of storytelling, which is something else that I write about in the book, because Matthew becomes, um, as he hears this whole story of what happened, um, he realizes that it's partly his responsibility to be sort of the keeper of this story and to record this oral history. Um, and one of the things I, I really felt was kind of important for me about the book was that it's intergenerational. So we have a very old character and a very young character, and that's not your, your usual children's book. Um, and yet there is a connection made through a story. And it, that story helps both the person telling it and the person receiving it. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's another important aspect for me of the book and why I think it's important to, for, because telling stories and receiving stories and being kind of the keeper of a story is a great privilege. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I want to encourage kids to do. Yeah. You know, uh, boy, life life has a, has a habit of slapping me upside the head every once in a while. And I've talked here in the podcast about how beautiful it is, these intergenerational relationships and how we don't celebrate them as much here in the States as we as they are celebrated in other cultures. Uh, and I talked, uh, I've talked here in the podcast a lot about the fact that my grandmother was one of my best friends in one of the relationships that I've held so dearly. And I f forget the fact that I'm currently involved in a very beautiful intergenerational 
friendship with my niece, except this time I'm the old guy. <laughs> She's the young kid. <laughs> and this is like the first time I realized, like, oh, I'm the old person. <laughs> but it really, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And I think it's something that um, not enough kids get to experience. Yeah, I mean, I grew up, as I said, in my grandmother's house um, mm -hmm. with her and my parents divorced when I was about, you know, 10, they separated and she was my rock. Like she really was, I'm an only child. So she was also kind of like this weird mix of mother and sibling and, you know, grandma. And um, and that relationship really is at the heart of, I, I think, of this story because mm -hmm. I really wrote it to sort of be her story keeper and to, to take this oral history um, and to put it into a book. And it, the book is not just, it is definitely about Ukraine. It definitely fills in that context for the moment so that people understand better, um, you know, Ukraine's history and how it has been treated, um, you know, both by the Soviet Union and by Russia. Um, and, you know, and, and I think gives people a really good understanding of, you know, the way it's being abused currently. Mm -hmm. um, but it also is a story that is kind of bigger than that in the sense that it really, um, you know, the last year is about is about relationships mm -hmm. and these relationships, as, as you're talking about, like between generations, you know, between periods of history. Um, and, you know, how we can use that to kind of broaden our, you know, our, our understanding and also our compassion. Yeah. I love that. I love that because I think um, the more compassion we have as a world, as a family, as individuals, the better our lives will be. I think that's, that's a good message. Yeah. <laughs> I, again, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you mm -hmm. certainly have more knowledge about Ukraine than I do. Um, any idea or thoughts of what the future may hold for that part of the world and those people? Well, um, I I don't know. I mm -hmm. mean, that's the honest answer. I don't know. I still have family there. Um, I keep in touch with them. Um, I worry about them. And one of the sort of more difficult parallels of this book that uh, that sort of emerged um, after the you know massive invasion in February was that you know my grandmother spent seventy years writing letters to her family. Um, she only saw them once after she left, um, and she worried about them. You know, through this famine, through World War II, you know, through the sort of Soviet era, um, and now I'm sort of you know I've met them, I've been there. Um, and now I feel a sense of, of worry. Um, and so, you know, I don't think any of us know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wouldn't I, I mean, I think that the Ukrainians are fighting for something that's incredibly important, which is their voice and their story and their, you know, self-determination um, and, you know, their rights as an independent nation. And I, you know, I I think that's an important battle. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, we'll certainly keep your family in our prayers. Thank you. In the meantime, tell everybody where they can go to find out more about you and find out more about the last year. Absolutely. So I have a website. It's Um, And there's a an really fantastic educator's guide to the book that gives um, educators and parents a sort of basic sort of one-on-one -on, -one on a lot of this 20th century history. Um, and so I think that's, that, that's helpful just so that everyone can understand. But I think the book is really at its heart. You don't have to understand all that. You can just follow the characters and you can sort of go on Matthew's journey, which is a journey of mystery and discovery. Um, and try to, and he figures out something about this family secret that, Gigi's been keeping that just basically blows up everything he knows about himself and her. Wow. Um, and I won't, I won't say more than that because I don't want to spoil it, but um, I challenge young readers to try to figure out, um, see if they could find, figure it out faster than Matthew, what's going on in this book. Yeah. Well, I want to challenge the parents that are listening to this too. not only go out and get your kids a copy of the lost year, but, Grab yourself a copy too. This is, I think this is a really powerful book to co-read with your kids. Possibly even more than reading aloud with your kids. That's a great experience. But I think this is a book that you want to take the time, allow your kid to read it, develop their own questions. And then when you're 
driving to school in the van or ballet or soccer or sitting down at dinner time. Have those conversations um, and and hear what the different perspectives are. And um, I think that that could be a really phenomenal family experience to have. Jed, I think that's a wonderful idea. I love it. Thank you. We've had a great time speaking to the author of The Lost Year, Catherine Marsh. Catherine, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guests will be Marie Weller and Paula Vertikoff. They'll be here to celebrate Cranium Critters, a really, really valuable book that can help you and your school teach kids social emotional lessons. It's a really fascinating conversation. You don't want to miss it. Uh, Marie and Paula are colleagues, a principal and guidance counselor at a school in Columbus, Ohio. Had a wonderful time speaking to them. They have some fantastic ideas that you will want to share with the folks at your kids' school. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Chris and Stark, by thanking our guest, Catherine Marsh. Please be sure to check out The Lost Years. I also want to thank our sponsor, Janie Emus. Don't forget to check out her wonderful book, Easter Eggs and Matzo Balls. And of course, we also want to thank Prue McDonald. Please be sure to check out The Chuckle Wobbles. It is her certified great read book. Really fantastic, fantastic book. I also want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Jordan Saley, Cassandra Mason A., Stephanie Davila. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. I want to give my son, Christopher, a big thank you for coming up from Florida to help out in this time of need here at the Crowded Mattress Studios. But most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.